Good morning, church. Good morning. Woohoo! Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday service here at PIC. If you are new here, welcome. If you are old here, hello again. <laughs> um, I would like to ask you all to stand to your feet, um, and we will say a word of prayer before we begin. Let's bow down our heads. Dear Lord God, thank you so much for bringing everyone here safely today. And I want to thank you for continuing to keep us safe and protected um, from the pandemic that's out there. Lord, I want to thank you for being with us throughout every day. And I just pray that you be here with us while we worship your name, Lord. And just allow us to worship you fully with no distractions, Lord. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's put our hands together for this one. Open the gates, Lord. Open the gates. Establish your kingdom. Open the heavens. Pour out your spirit. Jesus be with you. Let's declare. Oh, 
Jesus face to face. God is here. God is here. God is here. He is faithful. We draw near to see Jesus. Oh, oh Jesus, be real. Pour your spirit out. 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 Pour your spirit out.
Baby 
Give him a round of applause, everyone. Thank you, Thank you, Jesus. I can't believe we are into September. But you know what? God is in September. And God is in our October, November, and December too. God is not like us. God is amazing. He is here. He is there. He is everywhere. Let's just pray and let's just usher him and let's just begin to, to sense his presence, to Reach out by faith and just open up our hearts. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are amazing. You are the amazing God. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you sought us out, you saved us. And Lord, you are trying, oh God, to get our attention so that we can continue to grow and be more like you. Oh God, Lord, we pray that you, today you will show us another bit of yourself, a little bit more, so that we can begin to reach out to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I love the book of Isaiah. In fact, um, if you have a chance to look at my preaching Bible from the time I was 16, Isaiah is marked more than any other books, and Isaiah has more um, words written on the pages and more prophetic dates God spoke to me. And so Isaiah is a, a, a powerful book. And I'm preaching from one of the most um, well-known passages of Scripture, Isaiah 55. God is not like us. You know, we are so used to hearing, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. I just want to put it simply, God is not like us. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner we begin to, to uh, accommodate and begin to reach out, begin to seek Him with all our hearts and begin to put aside our own preconceived notions of God, the sooner we will know this amazing God. Uh, most believers are familiar with this scripture. But the question is, are you familiar with God? Are you familiar with God's ways and His thoughts? So how can we begin to know God's ways? 
And in what ways are his thoughts higher, his ways higher? So there are three aspects of approaching this. There are three aspects of how we can know God more. One, you can know God's way, words, what he says. Know God's words, know God's ways. Then you can know God's works. And uh, Israel knew God's works, but they didn't, they didn't know God too. So you can know God's works, what he does, how he does it. You got to know God's ways ultimately. And knowing God's ways is knowing who he is. Do you know your God? Because the Bible says, they that know their God can, are great and do a great exploits in His name. So I want to talk about the higher ways of God. You know, just a glimpse of His glory, just a semblance of His personality, His greatness, His power. You see, God is both incomprehensible and God is knowable at the same time. And that's, that's the great dichotomy. That's the great mystery of God. It's that He wants to be known and yet, he cannot really be known in his full extent because he's God. You know, if you can know God, then you must be God yourself. Uh, Psalm 145, 3 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Unsearchable. You know, so there are many other scriptures that you can look at. So knowing God is the ultimate experience, the ultimate knowledge, the ultimate purpose for living Knowing God is an inexhaustible pursuit, for God is limitless. And you know what? It is a good obsession. It's a good pursuit. And I will do it the rest of my life. I will run after God. I will run to know Him. And I will continue to cry out, God, show me your glory. Show me your face. Show me who you are. First thought, the God of the higher ways. He is also the God of even though. So he is the God of even though. I mean, like, what kind of a statement is that he's the God of even though? Let me read the scripture and you'll understand. Daniel chapter 9, verse 9. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving even though we have rebelled against him. Now you catch it, I hope. He is the God of even though. He's the God of even though we are not faithful, He's faithful. Even though we deny Him, yet He loves us. Even though we were lost in our sins, He sent His Son to die for us. God does not act or react like the way that you and I do. God is different. God is not like us. You cannot determine God's ways based on our human ways. We try to project ourselves on God all the time and we think that because we fail Him or because we think a certain way that God also will react to us the same way. But God is not that way. So don't try to put God in your own image. John eleven twenty five 25 says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. There you go, the statement again. Even though they die. He's the God of even though. In other words, you may think one way, God thinks otherwise. You may have given up hope, you may have come to the end of your line, your life, even, even though, even though. And so, don't limit God. He's the God of even though. God is not bound by human considerations. Again, this thing about us projecting on God trying to tell him who he should be. God is God. You know, we should begin to remold our image of God based on his revelation of himself to us. God is not bound by what we think, what we desire. He's not bound by our fears. He's not bound by all those things. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 to 18, you know the story of the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They were... Uh, thrown into a fiery furnace and, and before they did, they told King Nebuchadnezzar, they knew how serious it was. He says, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and He will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if He does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we do not serve your gods or worship the image of your God that you have set up. You know, this is basically coming to the point. 
It's one thing to know God's power to deliver. It's another thing to really know His way, His will in every unique situation. And, and these are three young men who, who knew God and, and, and knew what God was capable of doing. But even then, they knew the God of even though. We consider how God worked in this similar situation in the past and we try to instruct him on how he should act in our present situation. And the Hebrew children knew. They said, our God can deliver us, but if not, they didn't try to force God. They didn't try to say, God, you've always delivered. You've always delivered in this matter, but you know, you are God. You, you can do what you want. You know, and our consideration of the matter doesn't play a part in it. Maybe God did it that way a thousand times, but in your situation, God may want to do it a different way. He may want to deliver you in a different way, even though He may not deliver us from what we consider undesirable, but He will be present with us through it. Even though He doesn't deliver you from the fire, He will deliver you through the fire. You see, that even though it's a factor, the unknown factor about God that we need to always hold close to our heart. I know God can deliver me from anything, but is this how God is going to do it? To act in this situation? It is presumptuous to run around and say, you know, I don't need, you know, I don't need to take medication. I don't need doctors. I don't need the vaccination. God can deliver me. Yes, God can deliver you, but in this situation, is that what God is going to do? Even the three Hebrew children, even the men and women of God in the Bible were not presumptuous to say, no, God will do this, this way, my way. God is not bound by human considerations. Always know, God can do anything, but humble yourself, submit yourself to the God of the higher ways, the God of even though, even though you know what's best for yourself, even though you may quote scripture, God is God. He can do it another way. Even though he does not do what I expect, I will still worship him. That's our response. I will still serve him. I will still love him. I love that. You know, the, the other side of even though, even though God doesn't do what I expect, I still will not bow my knees to you, Nebuchadnezzar. That's what the, the three Hebrew children say. God did not deliver Daniel from the lion's den. He delivered him from the lion's mouth. You see, even though, you know, many people when they get thrown in the lion's den, they were like, what kind of a God? I prayed, you didn't set me free, forget it. Hey, you know, sometimes we act too quickly. Sometimes we react too quickly to experience the God of even though. We have to adopt an attitude of even if he does not. And I think all of us need to come to that place. We need to learn from the Hebrew children. Even if God does not do what I think He should. Even if God does not do what I prayed and fasted, would you still, still serve God? Would, would you still follow Him? Because if you, if you will not, it means that you don't understand. You don't know God. Because He is God. He can do anything. He always has something else up his sleeve. He always, always got something higher. He outthinks you, outmoves you, outwits you. But when you develop the but if not attitude, you will experience the even though. But if not, God, it's okay. God, I know. You know, I don't want to go through this situation. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to get sick. I don't want to have this. I, but if not... Whatever you choose, God, I know you're, the, you're going to be there for me. If you don't deliver me from it, you will deliver me through it, in it, out of it. You will do something. I know you. So experience the God of high, the higher ways, the God of even though. You see, God is also not bound by human constraints. He's not bound by our human considerations. He's not bound by human constraints. He's limitless. I love Psalm 23, verse 4. You know, especially the last, but even though it begins with, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and staff, they comfort me. He's saying this 
the human considerations which include human environments, human problems, human situations that are out of control. Says, Even though it is out of my hands, it is not out of your hands, God. That's what he means by God of highways. Human limitations never limit a limitless God, an all-powerful God. Even though we have to walk through uncomfortable, uncontrolled, unfavorable conditions, God is sovereign. I pray you will come to that, that confession and that, that conviction in your life. God is sovereign no matter what. So what does it mean? God is with me even if I don't feel it. God has a way out even if I don't know. I can't see it. God has his own plans even if I have exhausted all my options. God can see the outcome although I am blindsided. God is in total control. God is not bound by human constraints. Second thought along that same line. He is the God of the instead of. The instead of. You know, the world's favorite methodology of sales is bait and switch. It's election time again. Guess what? You know, that's where we're seeing money flying everywhere. Okay, you can build another tunnel under you know, the, the Fraser River to replace the George Massey Tunnel will give you money. You can build the Millennium Line longer, run it all the way to Langley, run it to UBC, will give you money. Why? Because you, they, they want, you know, they, they're throwing bait out there. They're saying, hey, look, you know, vote for me. Bait. And after they're elected, hey, you know, you see a different agenda. Okay, now we want to tax you. You sell your home, your principal residence, we're going to tax you, man. You know, and a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, bait and switch. We see that all the time. This is what you will get if you buy this, and then when you buy it, it's not what it was, you know, you know um, that's not what they, they, they showed you. So he blesses us instead of giving us what we deserve. That's, that's what, you know, I'm talking about, the God of instead of. So instead of judgment, God blesses us. He's the God of instead of. Um, in Isaiah 61 verse 3, he says, And he provides for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a garment, a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. He's saying this. Literally, it's like a bait and switch. This is what you deserve. I give you this. You deserve death because of sin. I give you my son, I give you life. This is what you deserve because you keep on rebelling, but I give you the promised land. You know, again and again, the God of instead of, instead of judgment, He gives us sonship, relationship, family. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is, not, is God not uh, giving us what we deserve. You know, we deserve judgment. And the mercy of God says, so he's the God of instead of. God turns around for your good what the enemy, enemy plans for evil. That's the other thing that is, the God, that is seen in the God of instead of. You know, so we see that often life, you know, throws a curveball at us. We know that in life there's forces, there's dark forces called the devil and, and of course the devil's uh, influence people that moves to do bad things. And, and instead of just allowing bad things to happen to us that we deserve, God turns around for your good, for my good, what the enemy plans for evil. I love Joseph's story. And this verse should always go down in your memory, in your mind. Genesis 50, 20. It says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. He turns around for good. Instead of cursed blessings. Instead of the terrible outcome. Life eternal. He's the God of instead of. You know, and, and, and we see so much has happened in this last year. You know, missions. We couldn't go out there. You know, instead of going globally, missions, now we call it global. Global but local. God is bringing them to us. You know, and we've seen it even in our baptism this last week. 
you know, when we were shut down, instead of being able to meet in person, God let us meet on Zoom. And in certain uh, cases, it became even more intimate, the sharing. And it led to discipling, which developed so many more people. So instead of going to them, they come to us. You know, when you look at the pandemic stories, we begin to see that, yes, this is also part of the enemy's plan. He planned it for evil, but God turns it around for good. He's the God of instead of. You know, instead of bad outcomes that we should be experiencing, we're seeing good outcomes. We see our church growing. We see the people of God growing in faith. You know, I, 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 I speak you know, not only to our church, but I speak to the church out there, all the Christians. Don't let the situation in the world, don't let the enemy have the upper hand. Reach out to God because he can turn around all the bad things and turn it for your good. The next thought, he is the God of more than enough. Higher, greater, better. He's the God of more than enough. You know, often when you look at the man of God in the Bible, when God calls them, he always asks them, what is in your hand? Right? A rod, throw it on the ground. You know, and, and we look at what's in our hands. But God tells us to look up to what is in the heavens. He tells us, don't look at what you have in your hands. Look up to all that is in the heavenly places. You know, that's where the scripture says, it continues, you know, his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. You know what God is saying? God is saying our problem is that we are too earth bound and God is saying, you've got to be heavenly minded. You've got to look at heaven. Because when you look at all those things that are bound, then that's all you have. That's all you can do. That's all you can see. Just not past the horizon and not past what's in your hand. And you know what? We don't have very much in our hands. God is more than enough because the source is higher. Higher. The source is heavenly. That's where he says, look up in the heavens, as high as the heavens. You know, how high is the heavens? You can't measure it. You know, just when you thought you got to the space station, hey, there's more. Just when we thought you got, get to the end of this, this, this uh, solar system, there's more. You, just when you thought that you got to the end of the universe, there's more. How high are the heavens? Hey, no one's measured it. And the Bible says, it's, uh, you know, the, the scientists are saying, it's expanding the world we live in. Heaven is beyond that. God is more than enough. His source is higher. He, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Not here. Don't look around you. Don't dig in the ground. It's not here. If you're looking for the resources here, you're missing the point. If you're looking for the strength here, you've lost it. Look beyond that. He's the God of more than enough, higher than the heavens. Moses wanted God, not just his provisions. You know, when we look at the life of Moses, God told them at one point, he says, I will take care of you. I will provide for you. But you know, when Moses argued with God, he says this. He says, yeah, it's good you're going to send your provisions. It's good you're going to send, you know, all these things to protect us. But to me, that's not good enough. I want your presence. I want you. You see, Moses knew God. The people didn't know. The people just said, ah, it's okay, just give us the food. Just give us the clothes. Just give us the victories. Just give us the miracles. But we don't want to hear God. Moses said, no, I want you. Many people would settle for God's protection. Most would settle for his blessings. But you know what? Those who know God, those who understand a little bit more about knowing God, they will never settle unless God is with them. They want God and His presence. Moses said, I don't want provision and protection without your presence. I'm not going to settle for any blessing without the blesser. I don't want the land without the Lord. Make that your prayer. You see, the principle of Moses' desire is found in Ephesians 33. Um, I mean, Exodus 33, verse 15. When you only have God's provisions, you still need, need other things. But when you have God, you have everything. That's why he knows that. Because he's the God of more than enough. So when you've got God, you've got more than enough. That's why when Moses asked him, what's your name? He says, I am. You know what he's saying? I am. 
You can fill in the blank. I'm more than enough. I am your love. I am your protection. I am just fill in the blank. A blank check. God. The God of more than enough. Let me move on to the next point. God invites us to know Him. Yes, God is incomprehensible in many ways, but He's knowable. And that's where He reaches out to us. Without Him reaching down and out to us, we would never know Him. And so God invites us. He says, come, come. I'm, I've come to you so that you can know me. He says, I've come so that we can relate. And relationship is based on intimacy, not just on information. That's where you do not marry someone based on a bio. They send you their resume. They send you your bio and a few photos. You read it and say, wow, what a wonderful husband to be or wife. I'm going to marry them. That information is not enough. You need intimacy. You need to get to know them. You need to have a relationship before you can know someone. You cannot really know someone just by reading their bio. Right? You've got to really, really spend time with them. You know, God says to every Christian, do you want to know me? You're not going to know me just by reading a few scriptures here and there. You're not just going to know me by what someone tells in a testimony about me. You've got to know me by coming into a relationship, communion with me, face to face. So take these steps to know, to know your God. One, desire. Desire is the first step to knowing God. And this is where I want to bring us back to Isaiah 55 again. I read from verse 8 to 9, God's ways are higher, His thoughts higher. But it begins with verse 1, He says, Ho, everyone who thirsts. God starts where it matters most. Right at the beginning, right at the starting point. He says, come. Come to the waters. You who have no money, come. Buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? He's not talking about this life. He's talking about more than this life. He's saying, why are you wasting your time, your effort? You're chasing all these things. He says, hey, come to know me. But it starts with desire because he talks about thirsting, hungering. You see, when we seek our own way, when we chase after our own fleshly desires, worldly things, we never really get what we want. And at the end of the day, we pay a very high price. Trust me. I've lived long enough. I've seen many, many wrecked lives. I've heard many death, deathbed confessions. Too many. Where people say, I regret, I regret, I regret. I wish everybody sometimes could hear those because it's so private that sometimes they don't want their children to hear that too. But when they say, I regret, I regret, I regret, you know what they're saying? It says, my whole life I chased this, I chased that, I desired this, I desired this. I wish that I had put first things first. I wish I had put God first. So how do I know Him intimately? You cannot really know God's ways merely by reading a passage of Scripture about Him. How many of you know about my wife, Kim? Well, most of you call her Sister Kim. And she's not a nun, by the way. You know, for those who don't know her, she's not Sister Kim because she's a nun. It's just our very Christian way of addressing people with respect. Many of you know her, but don't really know her, if you know what I mean. I know her very well. I know her ways. I can look at her and I know whether she's happy or me, with me or not. I can look at her and sometimes I may even be able to guess what she wants to do or what she wants to eat. I know her ways because I've spent a lifetime with her, loving her, giving to her, receiving from her. Same thing with God. You can't know God by just reading a few books, spending a few moments reading here and there a bit, hear a few sermons, you got to really, really desire and get into a relationship. Isaiah 28 verse 10 says, For precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. You know what God is saying? Hey, you know, even the Word of God, you know, you can't just know the Word of God just by one line. you got to read, read, read here, there, you know, experience it, 
you got to develop it. And the only way you, you begin to, to really soak into it is when there's a deep desire. So pray for desire from God. God, give me a desire, a hunger for you. A hunger for heavenly things. A hunger to know your ways. So develop an appetite for God's Word. Change your diet, change your life. You know, what you consume, what you read, what you take in makes who you are, the person that you are today. And so be careful with your diet. And that's where the, where the Scripture says, why do you spend money for that which is not bread? You know, he's saying, hey, you know, men shall not live by bread alone. You, 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 you're consuming all this stuff. But are you getting any closer, you know, to, to really knowing God, to really fulfillment, satisfaction? Uh-uh. Because you're not desiring the right thing. Secondly, discipline. Discipline trains your earthly senses to receive. Isaiah 55, verse 3 to 5, continuing on from verse 1 and 2, it says, Incline your ear and come to me. You know, incline your ear doesn't mean like, you know, you're sitting on a, you know, a recliner. It doesn't mean rest your ear. Incline means literally tilt your ear, stretch your ear, train your ear. You know, learn to tune in. Learn to focus in. Learn to discipline and train your earthly senses to receive from God. You see, this is not a passive practice. It's an active exercise. It's not passive. You don't just sit around and say, oh, okay, you've got you to speak, you speak. No, you train yourself. You dig through the Word. You, you spend time with God. You quieten your spirit. You tune in to God. You do all you can to chase after Him. You see, familiarity of God's Word brings clarity. Familiarity, clarity. Familiarity, clarity. The more familiar you are with God's Word, with God's ways, then you are clear about who He is. I'm very familiar with my wife. I'm familiar with a lot of people in the church, so sometimes when I talk to them, I know exactly where they're coming from, especially those that have been around a long time in our church, you know, through years of relationship. Experiential knowledge is essential. It's not just about information. It's about relationship. It's about transformation, becoming like the one that I desire to be. So really relating to Him. And then the next point is daily depending on God. Daily depend on God. Isaiah 55, verse 6 to 7. It says, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him while He is near. It's interesting. You mean God plays hide and seek? Does God play hide and seek with you? Evidently, He does with certain people because they always come and they say, Well, you know, I don't feel God near. You know, God is there. God is everywhere. How come, you know, He can be found only certain seasons. He, he, seek Him while He may be found because He's easily found when your heart is right with God, when your desire is there. But when you have neglected God, when you have done your own things, when your ears are inclined and tuned to other things, when you are chasing everything else, God is there, but He's hard to find because your heart is not there. Your heart is not there. And that's where bring your heart to where God is. Not the other way around. Seek the Lord while He may be found. When your heart is there, He's there. If your heart is not there, come on. Come on, let's be real. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Daily, depend on Him. You see, the tragedy of the Israelites throughout the 40 years, is this. The Israelites only knew God by His works. They saw what God did, but they never knew God. They saw things that you and I would say, God, if only I could see a miracle like that. I would serve every day, every moment of my life. I would give you everything. I mean, you know, that's reality, isn't it? Because they saw so much. Red Sea open, Red Sea closed you know, swallowed up Egyptian army. I mean, like, pillar of fire, clouds, water of the rock, manna. I mean, like, a voice coming out from, from the mountain, speaking to them. I mean, like, come on. 
They knew God by His works. They saw what God did, but they didn't know God. They didn't desire to draw near. When God said, come near, they backed off. They said, let Moses speak to us. But Moses knew something the rest of Israelites did not know. He had insight into God's character. Moses knew God's way. You know, Moses knew God because he spent time with God. He drew near to God. He prioritized God. And finally, unhindered reception results in uncommon perception of God. Unhindered reception results in uncommon perception of God. Remember those days when we had satellite TV? I still have my satellite dish hanging outside my house. I'm just too lazy to climb up and, and, and take it down. You know the thing about satellite dishes is that when the weather is great and stuff like that, and when there's no solar storms and stuff, it's clear. The picture is amazing. But when it thunderstorms and sometimes when the solar... It's hazy. The reception becomes choppy. And then your perception becomes blurred, right? The reception gets interrupted because of electronics and, and magnetic forces in, in, the, in the heavenly places and, and, and you can't see. You know, sometimes it just goes blank, blank for a few hours because it doesn't receive the transmission. Isaiah 55 talks about that. Verse 10 to 11. Isaiah 55, 10 to 11. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth. Reception. Are you standing there in the right place? Hey, when you stand under a thunderstorm, you can't miss it. You get soaked. You come into the presence of God, you get soaked. You stand under the power of the Holy Spirit, you get soaked. Snow. It brings bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me. But you know what God is saying? Go where anointed preaching is. Stay under the blessing of the Word of God. Receive it. Come with an open heart. Says, I can't wait to hear. I can't wait to receive the anointed Word from God. Because you know what? Something happens. That's why the Word, God, word of God says, if you open your arms wide, turn your umbrella upside down the other way, you receive more. Like a satellite dish, unhindered. But if you turn it the other way around, you're not going to get anything. Intimacy is based on interaction and not just mere interpretation of information. It's based on interaction. What's your interaction with God like? Are you just so hungry, so open, you can't wait to just receive? God, speak to me today. God, speak through pastor. Lord, speak the Word of God. And God pours out Himself to us. He promises that in His Word. He says, as the rain comes down, that's how God's word goes forth. That's, it's, it's, it's a parallel drawn of that. It's like the rain. Let it fall. Let it soak into your heart. And you know what? The more you do that, the more you begin to know God. You, the more you begin to recognize His voice, the more you begin to know what He's going to do, what He desires you to do, and we're going to talk in the next weeks to come about how God sees things, the will of God, and some of these things that is found in the book of Isaiah. So may God bless you. And let me pray for you that God will open up your heart for even more. Father, I thank you, Lord, that your word says, so, oh God, that your word goes forth and it doesn't return to you void. It achieves, it accomplishes the purpose that you set forth for it. And so let your word find fertile ground. Let it germinate, let it grow, let it become fruitful. And Lord, draw us near to you to be like you, to know your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. For those that are at home, we want to invite you to partake together with us this morning, the Holy Communion. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and he gave to them. And it says, this is my body which is broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of me, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let it bring health, let it bring healing, let it bring the relationship, the intimacy of God into your life.
In the same manner, the cup he poured, says, this is my blood of the new covenant. Drink it as often as you eat the bread. Father, I pray, O oh God, for all those that are out there listening, Lord, I pray for them, O oh God, that you will draw near to them, even as they draw near to you, O oh God. Lord, I pray that you reveal your ways to them. Lord, as they are disconnected from us physically, Lord, we pray that they will not be disconnected from you, O oh God, because you are spirit. And those that worship you, worship you in spirit and truth. So we seek you. We desire you. I pray, O oh God, for your healing to touch those who are sick. I pray, O oh God, for your, your powerful provisions for those in need. Lord, I pray, O oh God, for fellowship and connectedness for those that feel alone and lonely right now. Touch their lives, O oh God. Draw them back. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, and I see you next week again. We are back to our two services every Sunday, 9.30 and 11.30 in both services, in both campuses. And we want you to know, you don't need to register for any of the services. Just pop into a, to a 9.30 or 11.30 service. And if you're used to coming to the 9.30, please do so, the 11.30, just pop in. Join us, worship with us, draw close to God together with us. Lord bless you.